Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you all. Uh, my name is Anas Al Tikriti. I'm the Chief Executive Officer and the founder of the Cordoba Foundation, the uh, host and organizer of this conference today. I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for making it to uh, the conference um, that will proceed under the title Islam and Democracy Exploring the Strategies of Political Islam and the Muslim Brotherhood's Contribution. Um, I'd like to, um, first of all, get a couple of thanks and acknowledgements out of the way. And first and foremost, I'd like to um, express a deep and, 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 and quite profound thanks and gratitude to the, to the hotel that has agreed to host the conference. Uh, not just has uh, its services been outstanding, but also it has been quite uh, principled and quite uh, brave in the light of uh, a few uh, threats to, uh, on certain levels, if it uh, went and proceeded with holding this conference. So uh, I, I have to mark my gratitude to the hotel uh, and its staff, uh, each and every one of them, for the outstanding services that we have received. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank the convener for today, Dr. Abdullah Faliq, uh, my uh, old friend and colleague, and who's put all this together alongside an outstanding team of volunteers, everyone whom you see uh, working the aisles and uh, organizing the sessions, uh, carrying various issues, shifting various stuff. Uh, they have been working tirelessly in order to put this conference together and my gratitude goes to Abdullah Faliq and every single one of his team. The conference, as I'm pretty sure most of you will agree, comes at a very, very timely and opportune moment. The discussion not only locally or nationally, but also internationally, on the theme of political Islam, the Muslim Brotherhood specifically in the post-Arab Spring era, is one that needs to be given an injection of insights from a variety of uh, dimensions and perspectives. And I believe and I hope that today will add that, will achieve that particular aim. The media interest is obviously there, and we've all uh, had a look and seen various articles that have emerged over the past few weeks, months, uh, since the, uh, the military coup in Egypt in 2013, particularly focusing on the Muslim Brotherhood and political Islam and whether it's a good or bad thing and how this ties in into various events around the world, particularly those whom um, are labelled as uh, terrorist events that uh, fall under the label of terrorism. Um, and the discussion on the ideology, the approach, the narratives, and the actors um, who might or might not be linked to the Muslim Brotherhood um, nationally or globally. Um, I'm sure many of you have um, seen the uh, article that appeared in the Sunday Telegraph um, this last Sunday, um, also accusing a plethora of uh, civil society organizations here in the UK of being tied to the so-called global network of the Muslim Brotherhood. So it would be quite useful, I think, that today we address some of those issues and uh, we uh, shed light on some of the themes that will make the whole picture a lot more clearer to many of us. We are obviously here in the UK interested also in this particular theme because we have um, a review that the government set up almost uh, a year ago, uh, that is yet to see the light of day. Whilst we were promised that uh, the John Jenkins review would be published in July of last year, we have seen constant delays and now probably that report will never see the light of day um, for a variety of reasons which we can only speculate on simply because uh, we have had no um, official word from, from Whitehall. Um, so that also I think today uh, might be addressed in a variety of of, um, of manners and from different perspectives. It, uh, it gives us uh, incredible pleasure to uh, welcome uh, you all, delegates from all sorts of back backgrounds. Uh, amongst the crowd, we have politicians, we have people who work in the media, people who are scholars and thinkers, uh, people um, uh, you know, who are from academic backgrounds and the like, activists, um, from a variety of, uh, of interests uh, globally as well as uh, domestically. 
and um, hopefully that will also add to the kind of discussion that we're hoping to have throughout the day today. I'd uh, like to thank all those who agreed to uh, speak in the various panels. Um, most of you have traveled uh, from, let's say, nearby, from either London or just outside London. Um, and I thank each and every one of you. But uh, my gratitude goes particularly to our guests who have traveled from uh, abroad and from afar, um, especially Professor Yasin Akhtai and his team who uh, have traveled all the way from Turkey to be with us today, as well as Professor John Esposito, uh, a long-standing friend of the Cordoba Foundation and someone whom I'm pretty sure all of you have um, read for, 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 for many, many years on this particular issue. Um, uh, and I, I, I doubt that we have within the Muslim world someone who has written as much on political Islam or on Islam generally um, more than uh, John Esposito. So it's, it's great to have him back here in London. Um, this conference coincides with the 10th anniversary of the Cordoba Foundation. Uh, yes, I can barely believe it's either. It seemed like only a few months ago that uh, myself and uh, Abdullah Falak came together in a very small office in Victoria and started this whole, whole idea. Uh, the Cordoba Foundation was uh, established simply to understand and address why it was that the relationship between the West and the Muslim world um, went through ebbs and tides as it does. Why is it that um, at these times it is seen as highly problematic when there are so much strategic as well as commercial and trade interests that tie both spheres? Uh, are the troubles uh, because of ideological issues, faith issues? Are they because of historical uh, grievances? Are they because of mere uh, politique? What is it that governs the relationships between the Muslim world and the West? Is it a matter of narrative or is it real politics in play that affect, promote or maybe hinder those relations? And how is it that we can project for a better world for both people, uh, for both parts of the world? Um, that then mutated into uh, a variety and a whole spectrum of means and methods in order to come to a better understanding of this particular area, involving activities such as these, conferences, um, small-scale meetings, roundtables across the world, um, as well as being involved in initiatives to create peace and to build new relations in newly emerging realities in various countries. We've been involved in Sri Lanka, in Malaysia, in South Africa, um, and across uh, Europe on, on several levels. And, um, and despite the fact that um, throughout the 10 years, um, there are uh, times when one almost uh, thought of or contemplated giving up, um, the, uh, uh, the detractors, the attacks that we come under, um, actually have led to our resolve being uh, stronger uh, and uh, more solid. The uh, last of which I'm pretty sure that most of you heard um, was the designation of the Cordoba Foundation as a terrorist organization by the United Arab Emirates government. Now, uh, some of you, as uh, rightly I did at the time, snigger, but it's a serious accusation. Um, and just not to scare anyone or alarm anyone, but hey, you being here today, you're almost <laughs> complicit. So, um, um, but these go to justify and to add to our resolve and that what we're doing is bearing fruit. We remain um, a private organization. We're not a charity, by the way. Uh, we are a privately funded um, organization that uh, aims to create peace, to create a platform in which people can interact in dialogue and discussion on all levels, whether it be political, social, economic, ideological, faith. That's our aim, because if you have a culture and a safe place for open discussion and dialogue to take place, then the alternative is not going to be needed. And that's particularly what we aim to do. War and violence and, uh, and conflict seldom solved anything. In fact, I would say that they almost never solve anything. It's the culture of dialogue and discussion that we at the Cordoba Foundation believe in and try to cement and promote that creates the kind of reality that we all aspire to.
I have received, and I must acknowledge the comments that I've received from some of you, um, saying that um, it's unfair the way in which we've broken up the panels, three panels today, uh, because some of the panels, you, you know, one would like to attend all three, but, you know, unfortunately the, the, the limited time and space that we have, as well as all the themes that we want to touch on, we don't, we didn't want, the last thing we wanted was to hold a conference for the mere reason or cause to hold a conference and say that we've held a conference but then touch on issues very superficially. We want to touch on the areas where questions are being raised, where people want to understand more and hopefully engage in a constructive discussion. Um, we are going to touch on a variety of topics and I urge you all to, uh, uh, to get involved as much as possible. This conference is not held under Chatham House rules and therefore I urge you all to comment, to tweet, to Facebook, to Instagram, to do as much as you can in order to um, basically uh, tell about the conference and what you think of what's being said. Now that's, uh, that's me for now and uh, I'm going to hand over to our uh, speaker for the first uh, keynote address. Um, now, I have to say that this was initially, in the first schedule that some of you might still have in your hands, this was issued a few weeks ago, we had as uh, the, uh, the first speaker, Professor uh, George Joffe from uh, King's College, London. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately um, uh, Professor Joffe had to travel to the United States because he was asked to give uh, a statement uh, as a witness in a, in a ter terrorism case, so uh, he, uh, he couldn't say no, and um, he expressed his apologies and conveyed um, his regrets that he couldn't be here with us, but thankfully and kindly, um, we asked uh, Professor Jeffrey Haynes to step in, and he did at a very, very short notice, and for that, um, I, on everyone's behalf, am deeply grateful. Um, Professor Jeffrey Haynes is Associate Dean in the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at London Metropolitan University. He directs the University's Centre for the Study of Religion, Conflict and Cooperation. He is the author uh, or editor of 38 books, the most recent of which are Faith-Based Organisations at the United Nations, published by Palgrave in 2014, and Religion and Political Change in the Modern World, published by Routledge in 2014. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Geoffrey Haynes. I do have a PowerPoint. I'm hoping my colleague will magically produce, <coughs> magically produce it on the screen any moment. Um, unless I can do it, I don't know. Okay, well, just ad living for a moment then. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. It wasn't short notice, so every weakness and deficit of the talk is due to the late, lateness of me being asked. Otherwise, it would have been absolutely superb. I've got just 15 minutes to. Uh, cover a few of the uh, issues which we're going to spend the day on. Um, as you know, very few issues that we're concerned with today have absolute meaning that's objectively agreed with it by, by everybody. So this is, very, this, is, this is a very speculative introduction, but as I say, just to hopefully get some points to the uh, the rest of the day's concerns. Um, one of the key issues really is how we define some of the terms that we, that we talk about um, but tend to gloss over in terms of what precisely we mean. If we, for example, were to go around the room and ask each individual in the audience what an Islamist is, what Islamists are, what a moderate is, then we'd probably get different, different views and different judgments. Similarly with words like democracy. They don't have objective meaning, yet we use them as though we do. So the first point I think is to make is that methodologically, the terms we use are quite problematic, although essential in, in the sense that we wish to understand reality and we wish to understand a rather complex and often often um, unclear reality. The, the, the ideas that we are talking about and the actors that we will be talking about don't necessarily 
agree with our designation of them. So this adds another complexity to the issues of Islam, democracy, and the way that change is being exemplified, both in the Middle East and North Africa region, and in the UK in relation to Islam to some extent. So there's ambiguity, there's conflation of issues, and often overgeneralizations. But I suppose one could say that any, any, any field of endeavor is prone to such, such concerns, and that doesn't necessarily, or shouldn't necessarily, stop us from trying to take things forward. Um, I think we're looking at two, two overlapping but distinct developments today. We're looking at the, the astonishing events of the last five years in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, five years ago, four years ago, there seemed to be quite a lot of certainty on the, on the part of Western-based um, scholars of democratization that the Middle East and North Africa was finally engaging on a process of democratization that the rest of the world, most of the rest of the world, had undergone from the mid-1970s. This notion of the third wave of democracy, which saw dozens of countries move from a state of non-democracy to varying states of democracy. The Middle East and North Africa, of course, was a region which didn't seem to be touched by those events. And then suddenly, out of the blue, for many people, the, the so-called Arab Spring occurred from, the, from late 2010, revolutions in Egypt and Tunisia, overthrow of Gaddafi in Libya, and the onset of the still unfinished Syrian civil war, to mention just four of the key events which have, have transpired since then. It's, it's now very clear that the outcomes are unclear, and that to, to talk about a, a an easy move towards a democratic framework and structures within the countries of the Middle East and North Africa. The 20 plus countries in that region is, is simply not on the table. So we seem to have got into a, a phase, a stage of messy incompleteness in which states are less than stable, in which there are transnational actors of various kinds active across the region, in which political outcomes are, are very uncertain indeed. And the, and the rest of the international community seems to find it very hard to know what to do. So we're in a, quite a different set of circumstances in relation to the Middle East and North Africa. What is, what is also plain, of course, is the involvement of various actors which I'm calling political Islam here. And as we will see over the course of, of the day, the, the problems with such a generalized designation is that we have a, a range of actors that can be um, uh, categorized in that way, but a great lack of clarity about what precisely such actors seek to achieve. The focus is also on the UK. The, the conference is also interested in the, in, in the UK. And um, there are, of course, explicit links between the Middle East and North Africa and the UK in relation to the topic that we're looking at today. The, the two particularly that I was, I was just asked to focus on are the Counterterrorism and Security Bill, which is going through the UK Parliament right now, and the government's review of the Muslim Brotherhood, which we've heard already has got lost somewhere in the bowels of, of Whitehall and is not yet uh, published, and as we've heard, may not yet be published. Um, I'm not making any explicit links between the two developments especially, other than to say that these are two issues which are, which are taking the attention of the British government. And one could argue that, that both of these developments emanate from events which occurred in the Middle East and North Africa region over the last four or five years. The uh, Counterterrorism and Security Bill going through Parliament is, 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 is going to the uh, House of Lords now for further amendments. It's a bill which is about squarely about terrorism. It's about seeking to identify those identified as terrorists, to control their movements, to assess what they're doing, to enable British government to have more, more um, oversight into those it identifies as terrorists. It's a, it's a controversial bill, but it <coughs> follows in a, in, a, in a train of events in the West more generally, in which 
governments are trying very hard, it seems, to deal with what they perceive as terrorism, but finding it ex exceptionally difficult to actually take control of events in the way that they would like to achieve. The, the downside, one of the downsides, may well be that there is an increasing control of, of actors that the government identifies as terrorist or quasi-terrorist or would-be terrorist, and this can very easily circumscribe debates about political issues, political directions, and the way forward when it comes to um, political futures. So there's a great danger that this will instill and inhibit political debates in a way which is not, is not desirable. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood um, report, it's a controversial, as we've heard. It was scheduled to appear last summer. Um, it's almost certainly not going to appear this side of the election, if at all. And it's not so much, perhaps, that the government hasn't come to a conclusion or hasn't identified the issues it, it, it wants to take seriously, but it's extremely sensitive, on the one hand, and it also reflects a wider confusion about the role of what I'm calling political Islam after the democratic disappointments of the Arab Spring. The, the review was ordered by uh, David Cameron in um, April 2014, so nearly a year ago. And um, it's, it's often said that the UK government was bowing to pressure from some of its allies in the region, UAE, Saudi Arabia and Egypt to name but three, who in their own way are strongly hostile to this category of political actors I'm calling Islamists. Um, and the, the, the concern is that somehow various strands of political Islam are also involved in terrorist activities. And the UK may be concerned not to upset its allies in the region is um, willing to undertake such a review. But it's highly sensitive and it's difficult for the British government to come out with a clear um, conclusion. The Muslim Brotherhood was, of course, the leading player uh, in the Egyptian politics until July 2013, when the army overthrew the democratically elected government of Mo uh, President Morsi. And the UK government am ambassador to Saudi Arabia, John Jenkins, was asked to look at the, the, the Egyptian regional and international role of the Muslim Brotherhood. And Charles Farr, head of security and counterterrorism at the Home Office, was asked to look at Muslim uh, Brotherhood involvement in Britain. Far was to examine the philosophy, activities, impact and influence on UK national interests at home and abroad of the Muslim Brotherhood and of government policy towards the organisation. So it's a fairly comprehensive, wide-ranging, almost global focus upon an actor which had suddenly become vilified as a, as a political problem following the overthrow of the Egyptian government in 2013. Well, as we've already heard, John Jenkins finished his report months ago. It's, it's not, not appeared. The UK government is, I think, quite embarrassed at how to present its findings because nothing has been found, apparently, allegedly, by Jenkins to, to warrant the accusa ac accusation of terrorism. Now, we know that this term terrorism is an extremely vague and open-ended and an imprecise one, but nevertheless, it's still clear from my understanding that the report contains no damning evidence, no evidence at all, actually, about involvement in so-called terrorism. Um, there's an ide ideological issue because the Muslim Brotherhood is close to Hamas, and Hamas is itself identified as, as a terrorist organisation by Britain, the EU, Israel, and the USA. So there's kind of guilt by association to some extent, but that's not enough to produce a smoking gun um, from, the, from the British government's perspective, I think. Um, so we're, we're in a position now where the Muslim Brotherhood's position in the UK is highly problematic, but as yet no damning or other evidence from the UK government to enable us to, to, to say that that is in fact an accurate representation of the, um, of the organisation in the UK or indeed internationally and regionally. I wanted to just... Um, talk a little bit about um, political Islam. Um, it's, it's highly difficult and one can look at a number of scholars and see different ways of categorising various e examples of political Islam in action. Uh, 
in the Middle East and North Africa and in Britain, there are various radical groups and various moderate groups. And these terms are bandied around in a, in a way which is quite unclear um, analytically and in many ways methodologically. There's, there are, however, it's clear to, clear to say, I think, discernibly different strands of political Islam. Um, what I'm calling here uh, Islamic revivalists, which are um, against a, a, a westernization of their political environment and perhaps against uh, liberal democratic frameworks to do politics. And then, there, of course, what I'm calling Islamist reactionaries, the Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State, actors whose very worldview and raison d'etre is completely anti-democratic and, and it are intent on changing the status quo at the global level. It's necessary for me to highlight the differences in approaches between the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood and contemporary Muslim Brotherhood leaders. So the Muslim Brotherhood over time has moved from one um, kind of political position to a, to a more uh, to a more openness towards democratic ways of doing politics. And this, I think, would characterise uh, the notion of moderation. To some extent, there is a willingness to engage in democratically oriented politics in the context of a competitive political environment to seek and achieve power. Um, so I think I probably have my 15 minutes. I, I, I realise that I've not been uh, very in-depth about anything, but hopefully I've just raised a few issues which will be of wider concern over the, over the course of the day. Um, the, the Muslim Brotherhood's initial anti-Western outlook is to, uh, has changed to, to make the Muslim Brotherhood much more moderate in, the, in terms of the, the Salafists and the Jihadists, who see the Muslim Brotherhood as too liberal, too Western, and too moderate. So a polarisation, perhaps, that doesn't seek to evade the nuances of different shades of political Islam, but certainly we can start from the premise that there is a polarisation. This means willing to take Western approved, the Western-approved democratic route, including when necessary, willing to work with non-Muslims, and the Arab Spring effectively highlighted differences between, on the one hand, militant conservative forms of political Islam and moderates. So polarisation, bifurcation is an is, is a, is a overgeneralisation, but it's a starting point for understanding events uh, in the region and, to some extent, the emanations of political Islam here at home. And then just to finish off with some further reading, we will, have hear, of course, hear from John Esposito later on, but I can certainly recommend his book, The Future of Political Islam. Peter Mandeville, another American scholar, a uh, recent book called Islam and Politics, which is a very good overview. And an older book, but something of a classic of the genre, Jean Vol's Islam and Democracy from the late 1990s. So I will stop there. And thank you very much for your, for your time and your attention. And I um, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey Haynes. I appreciate that very much. And um, it does allow for an opening up of the discussions that we're hoping to have uh, throughout the rest of the day. Um, I'd like to um, now open for our morning uh, panel, and I'd like to invite um, the moderator for the panel, um, a very good friend and someone whom we've, uh, we've worked with over the years on many, many issues. Um, and uh, my gratitude goes to the Right Honourable Claire Short. Um, and just a brief uh, introduction, I'm pretty sure you all know uh, Claire, but she was a member of Parliament for Birmingham Ladywood from 1983 to 2010, and Secretary of State for International Development from 1997 to May 2003. In 2003, Claire resigned from the government over the Iraq War, and in 2006 she resigned the Labour Whip. In November 2004, her book, An Honourable Deception, New Labour, Iraq and the Misuse of Power was published in an attempt to explain why Tony Blair went to war in Iraq. In 2005, it was awarded Political Book of the Year by Channel 4. She stood down from Parliament in 2010 and is now active in various organisations including Trade, Justice for the Developing World and for a just settlement of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. She is a member of the Advisory Committee of International Lawyers for Africa. In March 2011, she was elected chair 
of the Extractive Industries Transparency into Initiatives, a mouthful, I have to say, E-I-T-I. -I. Um, and um, I would also like to uh, ask to come up to the main table, Professor Yasin Aqtai, uh, and I will leave uh, Claire to introduce her guests from the profiles, also Dr. Maha Azam and Dr. Azam Tamimi. So if you can all come up to the table and I will hand over to Claire Short. Well, good morning, everybody. It's, it's very good to see so many people here. I think they all say we'd all so, sell out one day, but you certainly sold out today with all the seats taken. This session is exploring the nature and manifestation of political Islam today. And we've got a glittering panel with very, very interesting experience with a Turkish, um, Egyptian, and Palestinian perspective, and we only have an hour. So it's, it's going to be very difficult to do justice to the quality of our speakers, and therefore I'm going to have to enforce the 10 minutes each, if you will forgive me. Um, but that's the only way we can keep this rich conference going. So with no, no more ado, um, I want to first a turn to Professor Yasin Akte, who's um, from Turkey, a distinguished academic and writer, and an activist in Turkish democracy. Okay. Uh, first, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and all the guests, and uh, thank you for Anas Al Takridi, Mohammed Sudan, and the Cordova Foundation, which organized that meeting and. Uh, make me really very, very much honored to be here among you to discuss this issue and this uh, struggle or this strive for more open society within the Muslim world. Uh, I talk about the more open society did that connotate the Karl Popper's uh, very famous book, uh, Open Society and Its Enemies. Now, uh, I think we are, it, is, uh, it is the time to talk about the uh, democracy in the Muslim world and its enemies. Who is the enemies of the democracy in the Muslim world? And uh, the, 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 the possible, the mostly possible uh, enemy uh, is indicated to be the political Islam or the rad Islamism or radical Islam in the, in the Muslim world. But that is really very, very bad and very uh, unfair uh, unfair propaganda, I think, from the beginning, by starting uh, to reject or to deny that uh, efforts for for uh, demonizing political Islam or the, the word political rather than Islam or Islamism. I think uh, the perception of Islamism or political Islamism uh, equates it with the utopian projects speaking uh, or seeking for radical transformation of society or the world by force. The concrete model for such kind of Islamism is exemplified by Taliban or to, uh, in, in, in nowadays by ISIS uh, or the so-called jihadist movements. The equation of all these movements with political Islam uh, is I think the core of the paradox since there is nothing political in such movements, I think, uh, in such movements, which, which are called militant Islam or political, there is nothing political. The concept of the political, above all, requires the discussion or negotiation with the other. So the ambiguity in conceptualiz conceptualizing the political Islam or Islamism or radical Islam or in general the relation between Islam and politics is prominent. In this usage of the term, the genuine dimension of the political, I think, is missing. And that is the, 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 the most important thing and the most important dangerous thing that's happening in our world, which are demonizing the, the world political. Actually, in normal, in normal uh, condition, under normal conditions, the world political is a positive word. But when it comes with Islam, it becomes a very <coughs> bad thing. When you, when you converge the word political with the word Islam, it becomes suddenly, it becomes, it, 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 it becomes a very dangerous thing. What is this thing that, is, that makes, uh, makes, makes uh, the word political so much dangerous? 
is it is 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 the problem is with the political or is the problem is with Islam? What is the problem? What we are like? Wh what we are liking? I mean, uh, do we like uh, um, uh, the Islam, which is always with gun? It, it is it is armed or militant Muslims who are armed and fighting, or people, the Muslim people who are negotiating, who are who are talking, who are defending something with political context or political uh, political processes. I think. Uh, the, the, the political, the, the world of the political, I think, is missing, and so the analysis uh, failed to identify to identify several manifestations of Islamism, since they cannot see Islamism uh, except in its imagined forms, which has nothing to do with the actual reality of the Muslims. Indeed, the Islamist discourses of the post-colonial times had a vision of Islamic state or Islamic government, which had been produced as mirror image of socialist revolutionary utopias and which might be considered as the base of such imagined Islamism. Some cases of this early Islamism had articulated its discourses through a claim for a revolution which would radically change uh, the social and political system into an alternative one, having been systemized and elaborated in modern times. However, even then, this was not the only articulation of Islamism and the actual variety of projects on the name of Islamic State could be considered as the historical manifestations of Islamism rather than Islamism as such. This kind of revolutionary Islamic movements managed to arrive at an Islamic revolution in Iran or a long-standing resistance movement in Afghanistan against the Russia, uh, Soviet uh, Union, radical opposition uh, uh, against or, or ra radical opposition movements in Egypt, Syria, Tunisia, Algeria, and so on, against uh, occupiers or dictators of post-colonial times. The Iranian practice of an Islamic state con constituted a very rich experience to think on the possibility of an ideal Islamic political model <laughs> in modern times. The experience was not less valuable than uh, the strong bureaucratic consequence of the theory in the Soviet practice in its relationship with the Marxist theory, which had requ required the abolishment of the state in its bureaucracy. And it is not an exaggeration to say that uh, through a revolution, uh, sorry, and it is not, uh, it is uh, that through a reflection on this experience, most Islamists had realized the modernist origins of some of their imagination of, the, of an Islamic state or of a revolution. The utopia has continuously revised again and again by new interpretation or practices of Islamic politics. Thus, the popularity of Islamic movements in general run with some flux and reflux, but never disappeared completely. Furthermore, these movements had to change their visions and strategies even with uh, the idea of an Islamic state. Even with, uh, sorry, uh, furthermore, these movements had to change their visions and strategies even with some reflections on their theoretical ideas about the idea of an Islamic state. Revolution, politics, democracy, etc. What remained after all this is that the manifestations of Islamic political have proliferated in time so that it became impossible to reduce Islamism to one cliche. Of course, there should be something common in all these political actions to underline uh, its Islamist, Islamist or Islamic character. It means Islamism is an ongoing, ongoing political process, requires some criteria, otherwise it will be difficult to distinguish what is really Islamism and what is not. Indeed, the lack of the criterion is that the only reason for the repeated declaration of the end of Islamism, so-called, so uh, which sometimes uh, periodically uh, occurs in our times, in, in the 20th century, even in the 21st century, which is always very soon followed by a failure of the declaration of that identification. I think uh, because of the time, narrow time, I, sh I should be uh, more brief and uh, indicate some my, my points. When, uh, let's go uh, just three, three or four years ago when, when the Arab Spring was still a spring and uh, at that time 
when the people, I, I mean, the people arose against the <coughs> dictators seeking for something, for example, seeking for, ref, for, for freedom, seeking for uh, honor, and uh, seeking for bread. That was the three basic elements which were prominent in these uh, revolutions, especially. And we remember that somebody talked about the end of Islamism because of there is nothing Islam, nothing Islamic demands within these, within these revolutions. <laughs> yes, actually, but just to seek for, the, we, 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 we heard and uh, I remember now many analyzes, social analyzes, sociological analyzes about the nature of that, uh, that revolutions, which were uh, as welcoming these revolutions because there was nothing Islamist in this. Actually, the expectation or the imagination of Islamism through this analysis was very interesting because nobody uh, suited to any uh, imagination of Islamism that an Islamism may seek for bread. Islamism may, be, may seek for democracy. Islamism may seek for, uh, for honor or for liberation. <laughs> or is, is there anything obstacle uh, within, uh, for example, thinking on the name of uh, Islamism, for example, to, to think or to seek for uh, democracy? No, people are not ready to think of, uh, of, of the convergence of Islam and democracy, actually. When, when the Muslims are seeking for democracy, oh, there is nothing Islamism there. That is the end of Islamism, they said. That is the bankruptcy of Islamism because they don't, they don't ask Islam, but they ask, is, that they ask democracy. That is very interesting cliche or very interesting prejudgment that a Muslim cannot seek for democracy. Actually, the basic, the sociological background of all these revolutions were being shaped by the Muslims, by people who are, who, who are taking their reference from Islam, but they were also think and ask for democracy, ask for, for freedom, ask for honor, ask for bread also. So, and uh, the, the Muslims and, and the idea or the expectation that Muslim cannot be with democracy is very interesting idea. Now, they are like somebody are like Muslims uh, always with uh, occupied with or, 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 or is uh, involved with uh, terroristic activities, uh, they, they act actually they misuse the term of political Islam with militant Islam rather than, uh, and, and they, they, they miss the, the idea or the, the element of political within uh, Islamism. Actually, political is not bad things. It is, it is very, it is positive element and there should be, uh, there should be prominent in all life. Whoever, in, in Turkey we had some experience, for example, we had an affair of something being politicized, for example. If, if Kurdish issue is politicized, that is dangerous. But we defended that, no, politicization is not bad, politicization is good, politicization is make, making something very easy to talk to each other, to build a world together, a joint world with all elements of the society. And I, thi I, I think we should continue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Professor, and I'm so sorry to cut you short to try and keep us to time at the whole day is a problem. But you'll all see on the bio biography, there's a number of his books listed, one of which is very recent, and I'm sure that would amplify your thoughts. So everyone should look for the opportunity to read your books. Um, now we have Dr. Maha Azam. She's um, a leading policy expert on the Middle East and political Islam an Associate Fellow of the Middle East and North Africa Program at Chatham House. Uh, she's Head of the Egyptian Revolutionary Council and Chair of Egyptians for Democracy UK. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd really like to thank the Kurtoba Foundation for putting this meeting together. Uh, it's extremely timely and uh, I really welcome their ability to be able to bring such a broad spectrum of people together. I think it's extremely important that we have this discussion across a broad ba base uh, of people. Um, let me start uh, by saying something about the manifestation of what is referred to as political Islam. The recent manifestation, and I think that's very important. We've heard this morning that it's important to define which group we're talking about. But let us assume that we're talking about 
the broadest, the largest, and the most representative of groups. That is, for example, in the case of Egypt and across the Muslim world, the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and look at the manifestation of their politics in recent time. Um, I think that there are certain statements that can be made, and again, we're open to discussing this uh, in, the, in the question period, is that they have remained the major bulwark against violence. That essentially today, in the midst of increasing pressure from authoritarian regimes throughout the Middle East region, particularly Egypt, and the country that I concentrate on and which I am actively engaged with, they have remained the major bulwark against the resort to violence. Secondly, they have engaged fully in the democratic process once it came about after the 2011 revolution. They engaged politically by forming a political party, the Freedom and Justice Party. They uh, engaged in free and fair elections and referendum in which the people of Egypt made their choices freely and chose them above other parties, particularly the FJP. So their engagement in politics and their playing by the rules of the game singled them out, I would argue, perhaps, as the most democratic of forces in Egypt. And the same can be said of the engagement of other parties across the region at different times, the Nahda in Tunisia, for example. In terms of the accusations made, again, against political Islam, that it, it doesn't evolve, that doesn't keep up with the times, I would argue, again, that is a misconception, that there is ongoing evolution within the movement of the Muslim Brotherhood, and much of the pressure for that evolution is coming from the youth, to which the elder uh, figures in the Muslim Brotherhood have listened and have made and continue to make very important changes, and we hear this from the youth among the Muslim Brotherhood themselves. That doesn't mean that there aren't more changes that are needed, but the reality of the situation of the on the ground has dictated that changes need to be made. So as a force that has strategic vision and is willing to evolve, I think the manifestation today is that they are continuing to attempt to do so. So what I'm trying to get at is that there are major misconceptions that require rigorous academic study, not only uh, a political statements which I am making, obviously as part of the Egyptian Revolutionary Council to which I belong and represent, which has elements of the Muslim Brotherhood in it, but it is telling because again, through this broad platform that is opposed to the military regime, there are a number of political forces, individuals, and a broad spectrum of political opinion that doesn't just include the Brotherhood. So again, another manifestation of the Brotherhood, which is the broadest and largest representative, if you like, of moderate political Islam, again, is the urge to become more inclusive and engage with others. The issue remains that this is a struggle on the ground in much of the Muslim majority countries, a struggle over rights. In the face of dictatorship, the struggle has been ongoing throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century from s for some very basic rights. The rights for uh, the right for freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, the, the call for accountability and participation. All the aspects of a democratic, uh, of democracy and the democratic process. These rights have not been achieved across much of the Arab world. And the struggle for those rights has been carried through by various Islamist groups and organizations. We're not talking now about those that I uh, believe are outside 
the, the, the spectrum of what is accepted both in terms ethically, in terms of political uh, uh, rules and regulations and in terms of religion, those that go outside that realm and resort to extremism and violence. I'm talking about the vast majority of Islamist movements. And those Islamist movements have been the, the, the bearers of the struggle for freedom and justice. They have, uh, they have, along with other secular and liberal and leftist forces, worked also for that freedom and justice. So I urge you for a moment to consider these movements and their struggle without the word Islam attached to it. To see the struggle today of those in Egypt fighting the military regime and its security forces and the violations of human rights, not as Islamists, but as people struggling for those rights, that have a vision in which they believe that struggle has components in it or through which they are inspired to struggle because of their faith or because of the principles of their faith. But ultimately, their struggle is universal. And it's a struggle that should be shared well beyond the borders of any region. So I think what we're facing today is essentially uh, a, a need to understand that there is a vast middle ground in Muslim majority countries and among Muslims worldwide that is saying we need to uh, ensure that those rights should be afforded regarding freedoms, regarding uh, justice, regarding social justice, should be afforded to all peoples the world over. Irrespective of who the bearers of that struggle are, if they are struggling on the basis of principles that emanate from the re their religion, good and well, there is no problem with that. As long as they don't resort to violence in order to do so against innocence. And that is essentially the framework of most Islamist parties working on the ground today. One of the major strategies, if you like, of the Islamist movement is to ensure that the resistance rem in the Muslim world remains peaceful. They are also uh, adamant that they become more inclusive. And finally, there are adamant that they reach out to the outside world. They don't work, want to work in isolation or to be marginalized or marginalize anyone else. But what they seek from the international community and civil society is not only a fair hearing, but they urge them to put pressure on their governments to review their policies regarding their support for dictatorship and ultimately the violence that emanates from such dictatorship in much of the Muslim world. So the struggle, again, is one over rights and the refusal of the Islamist movement to accept dictatorship that has lasted so long, for decades, in much of the Muslim world. And ultimately, I think we need to see the, the, the Islamist movements within the prism of a political struggle for liberation and rights, not in terms of what we are being told in, uh, by others who oppose any resurgence or, or change in the political order in much of the Muslim world that tells us that Islam is dogmatic, that it doesn't want change, that it is ultimately uh, connected somehow to violence. All these are sensational statements that don't uh, uh, accord justice to the vast majority of Muslims struggling for freedom throughout the world. Thank you very much. كم هي جميلة في الصور ولكنها أجمل عن قرب أدعو الجميع اقتنام فرصة الحج كانت رحلة ميسرة بحمد الله 
استفدت من وقتي في العبادة والدعاء دوم تورز عشر سنوات في خدمة حجاج بيت الله مبدعون ورياديون من غزة نقدم لعملائنا في مختلف أنحاء العالم مجموعة من الخدمات المتكاملة بوقت قياسي وجودة منافسة خدماتنا الهندسية تصميم المباني الديكور الداخلي خدماتنا الإدارية واللوجستية دراسات الجدوى خطط تطوير الأعمال والتحليل الإحصائي الترجمة بلغات متعددة خدماتنا التقنية تصميم وتطوير مواقع الإنترنت تطبيقات الأجهزة الذكية كالآيفون والآيباد وتطبيقات الأندرويد تطوير البرمجيات الإدارية والمالية تنفيذ الحملات الإعلانية والفيديوهات للحصول على العرض المميز والخطة الأمثل غازا سيرفيس بروفايدرز كنا نود أن يكون أحدا من عائلة الشهيدة المكرمة موجود بين الأحياء فينا ليستلم درع التكريم لكن الشهيدة أماني فضل أبو جزر بنت الكلية الجامعية فقدت كل أفراد عائلتها في الحرب وتبقى ابنتها الصغيرة فلتتفضل لاستلام درع التكريم أنتم الأحرار حصن كل نداء مثل لكم حصار مهمكم طيور أنتم الأحرار حصن كل داء ما دلكم حصار مهمكم قيود وكلكم شهود وكلكم شهود وصيتي لكم إن كنت لن أعود ألتقي بكم في جنة الخلود سأرسم الحضور دماء وورود وكلكم شهود وكلكم شهود أنتم أيها الشهداء الذين تصنعون مجدنا وكرامتنا والحياة بكم انتصرنا وسننتصر يا من أصدتم الأرض سنابل خير لم نترك أمانة دمائكم سنبقى على العهد والوفاء